Hey, greetings good people and welcome to another episode of Moshbits. Today we're going to start off with Apple since they just had their One More Thing event and there is actually one more thing I'd like to say as well. And you know what? Make that two, because first I want to thank everyone who has joined us for the Discord watch party yesterday and second, make sure to get subscribed and watch my side scrollers videos where I'm going to be talking about the Apple event a bit more in depth and especially about the Apple Silicon. In fact, let's start talking about the Apple Silicon already because this will obviously be a TLDR version because it's mosh bits after all, so what do you expect? But we have finally seen the M1 chip out in the wild. This is the name that Apple decided to go for for this one. And it, as much as it has been praised by Apple, the company has definitely not backed down from it because they decided to put it on three of its devices, those being the MacBook Air, the MacBook Pro and the Mac Mini. And no, if you're asking yourself, is there a big difference between those? like? Are there different SKUs, different versions? Well, no, there is no huge difference between them other than the MacBook Air has no fans to cool its SOC. And of course you get different ports and no, you actually don't get a lot more things. Well, <laughs> size-wise, you perhaps might get a few differences here and there, but like I said, I'm going to cover those things a bit more in detail in another video. But yes, you did hear that right. It's not just the chip on a motherboard, but rather a system on a chip. Apple decided to integrate its CPU cores, its GPU cores, its security enclave, and even more importantly, its RAM onto it. So let's just wave goodbye to upgradability yet again. So uh, thanks, Apple. No, not really. But other meaningful things that you might want to know from this launch are that the MacBook Air won't be sold with an Intel chip anymore, with the Mac Mini and MacBook Pro being on their path to exclusion as well. But happily, if you were wondering, hey, can I still get my hands on those Apple Intel based laptops, Alex? Well, yes, you most certainly can, unless you are hoping to get your hands on a MacBook Air because you're gonna have to get an older one. But in terms of performance, Apple did what Apple does best, which is a bit vague, um, or rather should I say being extremely vague about its performance, but don't worry, I'll talk about that in my event coverage video. You just need to know that those are either two times, three times, up to, all the way up to five times faster than <laughs> their PC counterparts, uh, whatever that means, because Apple, I'm, I'm definitely seeming to <laughs> starting to go on a, on a rant on this video. I don't want to do that. So you know what? Watch the other video. But let me give you an extra bit of information about the pricing because maybe that's something you're interested in. They're going to start at $699 for the Mac Mini, $999 for the Air and $1299 for the MacBook Pro with the last two offering an extra $100 off for education uses. So I think now we actually talked enough about the Apple event for a Moshbits episode, so let's move on to something else, but let's keep the conversation somewhat related to mobile chips and tell you that the A52 5G phone from Samsung, obviously, has been spotted in Geekbench running a Snapdragon 750G chip and 6GB of RAM, which might point out to Samsung actually using Qualcomm's chips even here in Europe, despite, like I said in some previous Moshbits episode, their Exynos 1080 and Exynos 2100 chips being banging, super amazing. <laughs> That'll be pretty awesome, especially since this chip packs a lot of punch for a mid-ranger with almost 300 points in single core and a thousand points in multi-core scenarios. Now obviously this won't be rivaling the 875 launching in December, but with that in mind, Huawei is apparently preparing to launch its P50 smartphone with the very same Snapdragon 875 chip now that they've somehow managed to get themselves a license. Now that would definitely be better for them than having to make their own, but let's just see how the US administration will handle the current trade war with them because obviously this is still a problem. Now their other brand Honor might actually be freed from the entire US trade war debacle if they decide to sell their company for 15.2 billion dollars that's a it's quite a lot of money <laughs> thus complying with the US government to reduce the Chinese influence now this is 
Of course, a lot to cover in just one episode, but I definitely expect Martin to do a far better job than I can in this Friday checkout episode, and obviously it's not out yet because it's not Friday, but you should go and subscribe to his channel, and knowing how much he enjoys covering Huawei and Honor, I definitely expect this to be covered this Friday, so do make sure to check out his channel, mark your calendars, whatever. Now let's talk about the usual, which is graphics cards around here. The RTX 3080 is presumably going to launch in January of 2021. This is a great card to compete with the 6900 XT, which will come in at $999 compared to the $1499 for the RTX 3090. Now, I don't really know what the 3080 uh, might cost, but if they want to compete against the 6900 XT, then I think 999 is the price to start at, basically. But I've talked about the 3080 in at least two of my previous videos, which I will be linking in the info tab, so if you'd like to learn more about it, then do make sure to check out those videos. But if you're in a budget, then maybe you'd like to first wait for the RTX 3050 to come out. I've been previously covering the 3050 Ti, but most recently, just today, we learned about a possible 3050 card, which would be based on the GA107 chip and sport 2304 CUDA cores, which would be a significant upgrade, obviously, over the 1650 and the 1650 Super. Those only have about 896 and 1280 CUDA cores, if I remember correctly. Now, if Nvidia sticks to their general configuration, we might actually see this card being paired with a 128-bit bus and 4GB of GDDR6 memory, which in turn should make it somewhat of a 2060 competitor, maybe 2060 Super in this case, albeit with less VRAM, which would unsurprisingly be what Nvidia might be looking to do in this case. I mean, they've obviously done that for the 3070, 3080 and 3090 as well, especially for the 3070 when you compare it to the 2080 Ti. It has, what, I think 3 gigs of VRAM less. Yeah, but let's move on and talk about AMD because we've also seen some benchmarks for their RX 6800 and 6800 XT cards in Geekbench of all <laughs> tests, but like I said, this time around, sadly, it's only Geekbench and not other benchmarks. Uh, they've been carried out, however, on both Intel and AMD systems. In their Intel-based system, they used a 10900 with a Z490 Maximus Extreme board and 16GB of DDR4 clocked at 3600MHz. And for the AMD system, we've seen it run with a top-of-the-line Ryzen 5950X, and I'd obviously expected them to have used a high-end board X570, but on, or I mean on the X570 chipset, but obviously we don't have that information, but it's most likely. I mean, why else would they use a Z490 Maximus Extreme in this case, right? Either way, the results indicated actually what we expected from AMD, which is an increase in performance when pairing it with the Ryzen 5000 series CPU. And Videocards has actually compiled the scores from, and from what we can see, the RX 6800 XT is going head to head against its main nemesis, in this case, the RTX 3080, with only a 3% overall loss in performance. Now, again, this doesn't mean that synthetic benchmarks will translate one-to-one -one into gaming performance, but even if that were the case, assuming MSRP for both cards, AMD would still be winning in terms of performance per dollar, and even performance per watt when you think about it, given AMD's offering a 50... Uh, well, not... Yeah, given they have a, a board that is 50 bucks cheaper than the RTX 3080, and about 20 watts more efficient when compared, of course, to the same board. So that's 300 compared to 320 watts. Now, expect to see more and more details coming out pretty soon as we're nearing to the exclusive launch of those cards. And if you'd like to get more information about them, then do make sure to check out my previous videos. In fact, you should just binge watch them because I've got quite a lot of content on graphics cards around here. But what about ray tracing on those cards? I think this is one topic that people are really interested to know more about, and sadly, I can't tell you much more. Obviously, we have <laughs> managed to get our hands on some other information, uh, and with that being said, we had benchmarks, leaks, um, synthetic benchmarks, sadly, in Port Royal, but this time around, um, 
AMD has come out and talked about uh, these new graphics cards and their performance in ray tracing and obviously they didn't mention the 15 to 20 percent disadvantage that we've seen um, in, in the previous benchmarks but Eric Bergman uh, AMD's ex executive vice president told us to expect a very good ray tracing performance overall but we're most likely going to see them support more ray tracing scenarios in games launching from 2021 onwards simply because as i was saying in other videos if developers implement ray tracing in xbox and playstation titles then they'll for sure make their way into pcs as well because you know what amd is powering both consoles so do expect that to be a thing now uh, AMD has also mentioned that they were targeting 1440p ray tracing, so that's a bit reassuring, let's say. I don't know, I would still think that, or argue that most people play at 1080p, but 1440p is definitely the, the right way to go uh, as we move on to 4K. But at the end of this interview, he also gave us a sneak peek at the RDNA 3 architecture, which he says should scale pretty well moving forward, and the Infinity Cache might be yet again the big difference maker in terms of performance per watt benefits. In other AMD news, the company has just unveiled its Ryzen embedded V2000 chips based on the previous Zen 2 architecture. Now this is nothing for us PC gamers, but instead it's actually meant for people who want to use it in different server scenarios and embedded applications such as thin clients, mini PC and edge systems. If this says nothing to you, then I'll definitely be leaving a link in the video description to read more about them, but with extremely low TDP um, ranging from 10 to 54 watts and 6 to 8 cores with 12 threads, uh, up to 16 threads in this case, and between 3.95 GHz to 4.25 GHz for the CPU and the GPU, Oh no, that's wrong, sorry, <laughs> that's insane, it, if you'd have that for GPU, oh my, that would be a lot, no, 3.95 gigahertz uh, to 4.25 gigahertz for the CPU, and the GPU should be right about in the 1.5 to 1.6 gigahertz range, man, just imagine having a graphics card that boosts up to 4.25 gigahertz, that'd be pretty insane. <laughs> Now, if you want to read more about this, like I said, I'll be leaving a link in the video description as well for the PR text that uh, AMD has sent out to so many people. So definitely make sure to check that out and do make sure to check me out on Twitter as well and check out our proud Discord server where we're, like I said, on the 1st of December, we're also going to be covering the Qualcomm Tech Summit. And I think that's going to be amazing. If you want to read all the original articles that I've talked about in this video, then like I said, the links to that are always going to be in the video description. And what else can I say? This has been Alice with a Red Elk. Thank you guys again for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.